Today's topic is what we call genome-wide mapping of traits, and you'll see what that means in a little bit. Um, and we're basically addressing one simple question to say, but hard question to answer. And that is, how do we map the genes responsible for phenotypic differences of interest? So phenotypic differences of interest, basically any trait you might be interested in. So we talked last time about different agricultural traits, like how many seeds a plant produces, uh, how fast it matures, how many flowers it produces. Those would be the kinds of things that, we, that I mean by saying phenotypic differences of interest. Um, and then mapping genes, um, that means identifying the genes that contribute to those differences. And if you remember from last time, I showed you these two rice plants, and I showed you that these are actually the sort of improved uh, post-Green Revolution variety. This is the pre-Green Revolution variety. This one's short and stocky and holds up uh, in the wind against, uh, you know, even though these uh, seeds have gotten really heavy and numerous. Um, and I told you that there is this gene SD1 that's actually mutant in the Green Revolution rice, and that's basically what makes the difference because that gene is involved in producing the plant hormone gibberellin, which makes the plants grow tall. And so if the gene is mutated, then there's not as much gibberellin and the plants don't grow as tall. Um, and we talked about sort of how you would prove that that gene was actually the one that was causing the difference. And we talked about sequencing the gene and, and seeing that there's a difference in sequence. We talked about putting the, the wild type or the normal version of the gene back into these plants and seeing that they grow taller. We talked about adding the hormone gibberellin to these plants, which is presumably lacking in them because they have this mutant gene and seeing that they grow taller. So we talked about how you get evidence that a particular gene, once you've identified it, actually does cause a trait difference like this. But we didn't talk about how you actually find the gene in the first place. How did they know to look at a gene like SD1 and say, OK, this might be the gene that causes the dif difference? So that's basically the subject of today's lecture, how you actually identify um, from this genome full of genes. You know, uh, Our genome has 30,000 genes. Um, rice genome has at least that many genes. Um, how do you find the one or more genes that actually contribute to a trait difference? Okay, And it won't always be um, a single gene, right? Some of the traits we're interested in are fairly complex traits, and there, we therefore expect that there might be more than one gene that contributes to a difference. So if you consider the domestication process of corn, going from a plant that grows like this to a plant that grows like this, that might, might uh, only be a difference in one gene, but um, perhaps there are dif differences in several genes that actually lead, several genes that actually lead to this kind of architectural difference in how the plant grows. Similarly, going from um, a cob like this of these sort of black hard seeds to something like this, which we recognize as corn, um, probably involves at least several genes um, changing to, to give you this new type of cob. And, and since this early domesticated variety to get to the sort of modern big ear of corn that we all are familiar with probably takes even more genes to change. Okay? So in some cases, we're looking for simple genetic changes that lead to differences in traits. But in most cases, we're looking for several or more genes changing to give rise to differences in traits. And, um, and the point I want to make first is that, in general, this is a very hard thing to do. Okay? And today, we're talking about plants. But um, I want to give you an example of how hard it is to do from something that's a lot more sort of relevant to us, which is uh, having to do with human phenotypes. Okay? And the example I want to use is obesity. Um, and the reason I can sort of switch back and forth and say, um, you know, we're really talking about plants, but here's an example from humans, is that the methods we're going to talk about today, the principles behind finding genes that are associated with traits, are portable. You know, it doesn't matter what organism you're studying. There are details that have to do with working with humans. Like, for example, you can't go plant a field of humans and see what progeny they produce and so on. Um, but the principles, the techniques, are basically all the same. So whether you're mapping genes that are different um, in rice, or mapping genes that are different in, different in fruit flies, or mapping genes that are different in, different in humans, uh, the principles are the same. And so 
by using a human example, I think I can drive home the point maybe more emphatically how, how difficult this task is um, and why it often leads to sort of uncertainty and sometimes controversy. Okay, so uh, this is a paper that was published a few years ago in Science. So Science is one of the two sort of most prestigious scientific journals to get your work published in. There are many people upstairs, you know, hoping their papers get published in Science. Okay, and so um, the title of this uh, paper is A Common Genetic Variant is Associated with Adult and Childhood Obesity. So that's a pretty easy title to understand, I hope. Um, what's another word for genetic variant? Allele, right. So the title could have been A Common Allele is Associated with Adult and Childhood Obesity. And basically what that means is these guys purported to find a um, genetic difference, you know, an allele in one individual that makes them more likely to be obese than an allele in another individual, okay? And, and so this is the, the abstract from the paper, a, a very brief summary of what the paper uh, showed, okay? And I just want to go through it. Um, so basically what they say is obesity is a heritable trait and a risk factor for many common diseases such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension. We used a dense whole genome scan of DNA, we'll talk about what that kind of thing means uh, later, of, uh, from the Framingham Heart Study participants. So the Framingham Heart Study, for those of you who don't know, is, a, is a, what's called a longitudinal study. So many people were recruited into this study, thousands of people were recruited into this study years ago, and they've been followed you know, uh, through sort of regular doctor examinations and tests of various kinds uh, for a really long time. Um, it's, it's this study that contributed a lot to sort of people realizing that they should eat oatmeal to lower their cholesterol and things like that. Um, and so now more and more genetic studies are also being done on them. And it's a, the, the, the point I want to make basically is a huge study, so thousands of people, right? Um, and they say that they identified a common allele near a particular gene called INSIG2 um, that's associated with obesity. That means people who have that allele are more likely to be obese than people who don't have the allele, okay? They say they've replicated the finding in four separate samples composed of individuals of different ancestries, so Western European, African Americans, um, children, um, so diverse groups of people, but within each group fairly homogeneous, and that's important because you don't want to confound sort of um, someone's ancestry and the effect of a particular gene, and we'll talk about this kind of effect later in the course when we talk about humans again. But the idea is that they didn't just do this experiment on one group of people, they sort of partitioned their sample into several groups and saw the same effect. Um, and what they concluded is that this predisposing genotype, so this particular allele, is present in 10% of individuals. Um, and that, uh, and so that's a lot, right? So, um, so that's why they say a common genetic variant, not a rare one. So this is something that's floating around the human population. 10% of people have this version of the INSIG2 gene, and it predisposes you, according to these guys, um, to be obese. Okay, does that make sense? Right? Next year, the trouble starts. Okay? So what I'm going to show you on the next few slides is a series of responses to this paper that also appeared in Science, okay, the following year. Um, and they're all comments on this paper that I just told you about, okay, by this group of researchers led by Alan Herbert, okay? So what these guys say is that Herbert and colleagues reported an association between this gene, in particular this allele, so this is the name of the allele, RS, blah, 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 and obesity in four sample populations under a recessive model. So under a recessive model means just if you have two copies, if both your copies from each parent are this allele, then you're at risk for obesity more than you otherwise would be. Um, they attempted to replicate this study in 10,000 Caucasian individuals. Again, a huge, huge, huge study. Um, combining a bunch of different approaches, family-based, case control, and general population studies. So these are basically epidemiological terms for just how you study human populations. But they found no support for a major role of this variant in obesity. So here you have one study published in Science in 2006 saying, here it is, here's an allele that's common in human populations and it gives you a higher risk for obesity. Next year, paper comes out saying, we tried to replicate the study. We weren't being, you know, sort of, um, 
careless about it. We did it in 10,000 individuals. We really wanted a big sample size. Um, but we couldn't find the same result. Okay. Another letter. S comment on the same petter. paper. Herbert and colleagues found that this allele located upstream of this gene was consistently associated with increased body mass index, which is the way um, obesity, one way obesity is measured. However, we found no evidence of association between this allele and body mass index in two large ethnically homogeneous population-based cohorts. Again, really large samples, two samples. On the contrary, an opposite tendency was observed. So these guys not only did not replicate the original finding, they found the opposite result. So that instead of this allele being associated with a higher risk of obesity, it was actually associated with a lower risk of obesity. Okay. One more. Again, you, you should get the theme by now, right? Contrary to the findings of Herbert et al., et al um, homozygous carriers, again, recessive, so they're looking at people with two uh, copies of this allele um, near this gene, did not exhibit a significant increased risk for obesity in a large German study. Again, lots of people, big population. Um, but maybe there's a wrinkle here. A subgroup analysis revealed that this allele significantly increased the risk for obesity in already overweight individuals, suggesting that the risk factor maybe is combined with other risk factors, and that's what's predictive. Okay. So I think what's actually most informative is how these guys responded to all the criticism. Okay, think about it, right? You have, you're, you, 2006, you're excited, you found this really important uh, result, you got your paper into science, you break open the champagne, and then you know, all this criticism starts coming in. So how do you respond to it? Um, and this is, again, to remind you that science is a, is a social affair as much as it is a sort of uh, objective uh, pursuit of knowledge, right? Um, so what, are the, what do you have to do? You say, well, well, maybe we were wrong. And how do you say that? Um, you say it like this. Identification of alleles affecting complex traits such as obesity is confounded by many types of bias, especially when effect sizes are small. So this is basically saying what I said to begin with, that this business is hard. Okay? Espe and especially when effect sizes are small. That is when the effect of a particular allele at a gene isn't obvious. It doesn't either like automatically make you obese or not obese. Um, it gives you some probability of maybe having a higher body mass index. Um, given our previous findings, a false positive finding cannot be ruled out with certainty. That is, um, you know, perhaps we just got unlucky. Perhaps we did everything right and our experiment told us what it told us, but, you know, for statistical reasons it was off for some reason. Um, but they say it still seems unlikely. I mean, they're still confident that they showed something real. Um, and so basically what they're saying is that in the future, more and more large studies will have to be done to really figure out this thing. Okay, so how large does this have to be? Already, between these five uh, uh, papers, you have you know, tens of thousands of individuals who have been studied. So um, when you think about how much bigger this has to be, then maybe the only way to really figure it out is to essentially sample everyone. Okay, so I hope that's convinced you that um, even you know try as we might as geneticists to find the genes that influence complex traits, um, especially traits that are involve obviously some genetic component and some environmental component, um, and and complicated interactions between the two. It's hard. Um, it's hard, and uh, people don't always get the right answer. They often get conflicting answers, um, and and. Um, that's something we have to deal with, and that's why I think it's important for you as sort of uh, you know, educated citizens of the world whose, whose lives will sort of more and more be influenced by what people say about your genes um, to understand how difficult this is. And when someone comes to you and says, you know, I found the gene for X or I found the gene for Y or give me $300, I'll tell you what your genes say about X or I'll tell, tell you what your genes say about Y. Um, that uh, you know a little bit more. My job, I think, is to help you know a little bit more about how, the, how that information actually comes to be so that you can evaluate it better. And um, one of your peers has already uh, posted an interesting article on the blog site um, about this very topic. So um, this New York Times article, um, this is the title of it, Consumers Slow to Embrace the Age of Genomics, 
um, is kind of critical of um, these companies like um, 23andMe and other companies that um, sell you basically DNA tests, right? So you pay anywhere from a few hundred dollars to some companies, you know, thousands of dollars to get your DNA read, and then they give you back a report that says, hey, you're at risk for this, you're at risk for that, okay? And uh, one of the interesting things about the article is um, basically they're saying these companies are in trouble because people aren't really using them as much as the people who started the companies had hoped. Um, and one of the insights, I think, in the article, which is definitely true, is this one right here, um, which is that the services face a fundamental problem, which is that in most cases, our current level of understanding is not sufficient to make meaningful predictions about the risk that a person will get a disease. Okay? There are certain diseases where, where the certainty is 100%. Okay? So if you go and you get a test and it says you're at risk for Huntington's disease, you know, because you have 100-something repeats in your Huntington gene, um, that's 100%. You, know, y you're, y you will develop Huntington's disease. Okay? But for many of the other things we care about, risk of heart attack, risk of various forms of cancer, risk of you know, obesity, for example, um, the knowledge just isn't there. And so um, that causes two problems. It causes sort of false hope that the information is actually telling you something when it's based on sort of our best current information. And as you can see, that kind of thing can turn around in the course of a year. Um, and, it, and it also causes, uh, Another sort of more subtle problem, which is that if you think about how any disease like that that's complicated, like diabetes or, or heart disease, is going to work, you're going to have some allele that increases your risk of something by, say, 10% at most. Okay? And so as consumers, I think we're good at understanding, well, there's a 100% risk I'll get something, or maybe even a 90% risk of getting something. But how do you evaluate life choices, medical decisions, when the percent probability that you're going to get some disease has increased by 5%? Okay? It's not clear whether you sort of scrap everything you've been doing, turn your whole life around, and change uh, just because of that increased risk of 5%. How think about it this way. How much of a percent increased risk would it have to be for you to change your lifestyle? Right? If someone said, um, you're at increased risk of heart disease, but if you start jogging every day for two hours, that'll come back down a little bit. Okay? Well, if the increased risk of heart disease is you know, 90%, you'll get a heart attack by age 30, then maybe that jogging will be something you'll actually do. But if they say the increased ris risk of heart attack is going to be you know, 5% by age 50, you know, I'm guessing you, you'll stay on the couch. All right, so these are the kinds of things I want you to really be thinking about as we discuss um, sort of complex traits and, um, and how genes that determine them are involved. And, and again, we're going to sort of leave humans in a second, although we're going to come back to it later in the course, um, and talk about plants, because at least plants are uncontroversial. At least once you, th you think you've identified a gene um, that has something to do with a trait, you have ways of really establishing that that gene really is important. Um, and doing more and more experiments. So, so I think it's useful to talk about the methodology in sort of this uncontroversial situation, but understand that the methodology basically applies to these controversial cases as well. Okay, and just before we leave humans, um, I do want to uh, play two clips that I played in the very first lecture that sort of give you the span of sort of scientific opinion on this question of, for humans, whether our traits really are determined by our genes or not. Okay, so I just want to play these two clips again. Back to sort of uncontroversial, maybe a little bit boring. How do you actually figure out the genes that are associated with particular traits? And so um, what I'm going to show you today is how you do it in organisms where you can actually manipulate them and do crosses between them. So you can say, I'm going to take this as the female parent, this as the male parent, cross them together, see what their offspring are, and so on. Um, as you'll see, the same kind of logic works for humans, although you're not doing intentional crosses. You can follow pedigrees of large families, for example, as a way of doing genetics in humans. Okay? And so the first thing I want to um, remind you of um, 
is one of Mendel's laws, okay, and this is called the law of independent assortment. Um, and this is going to start to be the basis of how we figure out genes that are associated with particular traits. Um, so what I'm drawing here are two different chromosomes. So imagine this is, you know, chromosome 3 and chromosome 13 of rice, okay, two different pairs of chromosomes. I'm showing them as a pair and another pair because rice, like us, inherits one copy of each chromosome from each parent, okay, so you have two of each, right? And so this is the SD1 mutation that is um, uh, characteristic of the green, green Revolution rice, okay? And up here, I'm, I'm showing the, s the same gene, and I'm drawing it as a plus. So when I, when I draw a plus like that, basically all I mean is that this is the normal version of the gene. Okay, this is the mutant version, this is the normal version, um, and we usually call that normal version the wild type. Okay, so there you go, SD1 mutant, SD1 wild type, and then uh, this is another gene that we'll talk about later in today's lecture, QSH1, okay, mutant wild type. Okay, and so the individual, so you can imagine this is an individual's genotype that I'm drawing here. And this individual, we would say, is heterozygous for both genes. It has one copy of each of these alleles for this gene and one copy of each of these alleles for this gene. Okay? And the question is, when, when um, that's the genotype, what kind of gametes can that individual produce? So when you produce gametes, you get one copy of each chromosome. Okay? So you'll get either that copy or that copy, and you'll get either that copy or that copy. So you can think about this individual producing a gamete, which I'm showing, say, as an egg, okay? And it only gets one of each chromosome, and in this example, I'm showing it getting the, the copy of this chromosome that has the SD1 mutation on it, and the copy of this chromosome that has the QSH1 mutation on it. Does that make sense? How many other types of gametes can this individual produce? Three. I think I heard three. People said three. Okay, three, right? Because you either get this with this, this with this, this with that, or that with that. Okay, it's basically flipping a coin on each one. So the plus is a way for me to say the same gene as this, but the normal version of it. Okay, and we usually say that's the wild type version. So the plus is basically the wild type allele of the gene that's mutant. Right, so this is, this is just one example of a gamete that can form, and it's because just by chance you'll get this chromosome and you'll get that chromosome. Right? But there are three other possibilities. You could get this one with this one, you could get this one with this one, and you could get that one with that one. And they're all equally likely. That's basically the basis of Mendel's law, that all four of those possibilities are equally likely. So this, right, so, so this is one parent producing one gamete, okay? And basically this parent produces four classes of gametes, okay? And 25% of them will be this. Okay, so Mendel's law of independent assortment is not a universal law because genes that are on the same chromosome tend to be inherited together. Okay, and this is what we usually call linkage or genetic linkage. Okay? And so here's another gene called SPS1. It, it encodes an enzyme, uh, sucrate phosphate, sucrose phosphate synthase. Um, not necessary for you to know what that is. Okay? But basically, this is you know, what the rice chromosome looks like. This gene is on the same chromosome as this gene. Okay? Imagine this long chromosome and different parts of it. There's the SD1 gene and there's the SPS1 gene. So, um, you can think about what happens now when this parent produces gametes, okay? And what happens is genes that are linked like this on the same chromosome tend to be inherited as a unit, okay? And so one possible gamete you can get is SD1 and wild type allele of SPS1, okay? Another type of gamete you could get is wild type allele of SD1 and SPS1 mutant. Um, and 
that's going to happen most of the time because these two genes are on the same chromosome. But it doesn't happen always. Um, and the reason it doesn't happen always is that sometimes chromosomes, um, when in the process of forming gametes, gametes, they break at a particular location and they swap. Okay? And this is a process called recombination. Okay? And this is actually uh, the crux of the matter. This is the basis by which we can actually tell genes that are associated with traits. Okay, so this is important. Um, I'm now drawing these chromosomes as blue and red, so they're easier to track. Okay? And basically what happens in recombination is the two chromosomes break in the same place, and then they swap parts. Okay? Does everyone see that? Start like that, break them, and then rejoin the right side red up top and the right side blue down below, like that. Got it? So this is how we start, right? So the blue plus sign is the wild type of SD1, okay. and the red plus sign is the wild type of SD1. So the location is what gene okay. it is, okay. right? And the color is what chromosome it was on originally. Right, from this individual's parents, these two chromosomes were, yeah, one from the male parent, one from the female parent, okay? So, so this individual is now an adult and is about to produce gametes, okay? But the gametes that produced it, one contained this chromosome and the other contained this chromosome. Okay, and so these chromosomes break and we say recombine so that this blue part is down here now and this red part is up up there now, okay? And this is a real physical process. We can see it under the microscope, okay? So these are chromosomes that are undergoing meiosis, the process of making gametes, okay? And you can see this cross here is where the chromosomes have broken and exchanged, okay? Cross here where the chromosomes have broken and exchanged, okay? These are two uh, chromosomes lined up. So when that happens, then it's possible from a parent like this to get a gamete where, say, SD1 mutant and SPS1 mutant are, are on the same chromosome now. Okay? But this is not 25% of the gametes as it would be if they were on different chromosomes. This is much, a much smaller percentage of gametes that are like this because this breaking and rejoining, this recombining, is, is rare. It doesn't happen very often, and it happens um, less often if the genes are close together, okay? So now I'm drawing sort of an arbitrary map of two chromosomes, okay, where we have seven genes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, okay? And for each we have two alleles, so big A, little a, big B, little b, and so on, okay? And these are their distances, relative distances along the chromosome, okay? And so uh, the point is that if they're far apart on the chromosome, then the probability that there will be one of these breaking and rejoining events in between them is actually fairly high. Um, so it's actually close to 50% of the gametes you get out of this individual will have big A with little g or little a with big g. Okay? It's almost as if they were on different chromosomes. Okay? If two genes are far enough apart on the same chromosome, they look, they behave as if they're on different chromosomes because the probability of the chromosomes breaking and rejoining somewhere in between those two genes is actually high. But if two genes are very close together, then there's a l very low probability of recombination between them. That is, there's a very low probability that, that one of those breaks and rejoining events is going to happen in between these two genes. Okay? So the probability of getting a gamete from this individual that's big D with little e or little d with big E is very, very low. It depends on distance, right? It okay. depends entirely, and that's what we're going to go through right now. Okay. So if they're on different chromosomes, or if they're really far apart on the same chromosome, then you get four types of gametes, and they're each 25%, okay? But as you get closer and closer together, those percentages change. 
until the extreme where if they were right on top of each other, if they were right next to each other, then you would only get two gamete types. They would be, say, big D, big E, or little d, little e, and they would be 50-50, and there would be no big D, little e, or little d, big e. Okay? And that's how we actually get to the point where we can say two genes are next to each other, and that allows us to say, as you'll see in a little bit, that a gene is associated with a particular trait. Okay, but we're, we're, we're not there yet. Okay, we're building up to the point where we can say a gene is associated with a trait. Okay, the first thing we have to do, though, is investigate in a little bit more detail how you use the information in terms of how many gametes of each type you get to tell how far apart two genes are. Okay, um, and we call this mapping uh, because you're basically building one of these sort of linear representations of the chromosome. Okay, and the experiment is actually fairly simple, but then there's sort of a little bit of math involved, um, uh, which I hope will not be too intimidating. Okay, so here's the idea. Let's say that there are two traits we're interested in, uh, flower color and flower height, or plant height, okay? And for the sake of argument for now, let's just say that there's one gene that controls the flower color and one gene that controls the plant height. They're different genes. But they're different genes on the same chromosome. Okay? So um, we can write the genotypes now like this. And I'm also going to give you, well, so let's look at it, right? So we have a um, red flower crossed with a yellow flower, and we get a red flower. Okay? So is the red allele of the, of the flower color gene dominant or recessive? It's dominant. Okay? So we're going to call that gene R and big R corresponds to um, red flowers. Okay. Dominant means that when you have different phenotypes in the parents, uh, the phenotype of the offspring matches one of the parents and that's dominant. Okay. So red flower color is dominant and we crossed a short plant with a tall plant and we got a short plant. So which one's dominant? Short. Okay. And so that's why I'm writing the genotype here as big R, big S for this plant, and little r, little s for this plant, because this plant is neither red nor short. Okay? And I'm drawing both of the chromosomes, and they're identical. Okay? And they're identical because we can say that these are what are called true breeding varieties. That is, you know, no matter how many progeny these plants have with each other, you always get red short plants. No matter how many progeny um, these have with each other, you always get yellow tall plants. So they're probably homozygous for every gene. OK, so you do this cross, and you get your hybrid. And the genotype of the hybrid is this. It's heterozygous at both. So it's big R, little r, big S, little s. OK? Now you do one more cross, and that allows you to tell how far apart these genes are. OK? What you do is you take these hybrids, and you cross them back to the recessive parent. OK, and that's what's shown on the next slide. So this is the hybrid that's heterozygous for both genes. And you're crossing it back to the recessive parental type, okay, which is this tall yellow flower, which has this genotype. Okay? And the reason you cross it back to the recessive parental type is that then whatever progeny these two plants have together, um, their appearance is entirely determined by the gametes that this one produces. Okay? Because this one is just sort of like the, the blank slate that, that that one's genotype is written upon. Because if you think about, if this parent passes on the big R allele, then you'll get a progeny that's big R, little r, and the plant will be red. And you'll know for sure that it got the big R allele from this parent. And likewise, if, if this parent passes on the little s allele, the progeny will be little s, little s, so they'll be tall. Okay? And you'll know then that this parent passed on the little s allele. Okay? But this cross produces four possible types of offspring. Okay? There are two types that are these, that are big R, big S, with little r, little s. Now, all of the genotypes I write down here, the bottom chromosome is going to be little r, little s, because that's all this parent provides. Right? This parent provide some combination of these. Okay, so one possibility is, is big R, big S is passed on. 
Another possibility is little r, little s. These two types are the most common types, and they're called the parental types. Okay? They're called the parental types because, as you can see, this genotype is exactly the same as this genotype. This genotype is exactly the same as that genotype. Okay? And they're the most common types because these two types don't involve any recombination. They don't involve any breaking and rejoining of these two chromosomes. Okay? You get this chromosome intact, or you get that chromosome intact. The two other types look like this. And these are generated by recombination in that parent. Okay, again, they get little r, little s from this parent. right? And in this case, they get little r, big s. Okay? And in this case, they get big r, little s. Now, both of those involve breaking and rejoining in between these two genes. Okay? The only way to get big R, little s is if these two chromosomes break and rejoin. The only way to get little r, big S is if these two chromosomes break and rejoin. Okay? Those are the genotypes. And their phenotype should make sense to you. Okay? This is little r, little r, so the flowers are not red, they're yellow. This is big R, little r. Big R is dominant, so the flower is red. This is big S, little s. Short is dominant, so these are short. And this is little s, little s. Short is dominant, so these are tall. Um, right, so that's, that's this capital letter or this capital letter. Okay, so the top row here is the chromosome that's inherited from this parent. And the bottom row is the chromosome that's inherited from this parent. And that's always little r, little s. Right? So the two recombinant types each have one small letter and one big letter. Right? Maybe s is not the best choice to use here because it's hard to tell a capital from a lowercase. Right, so, so take us as an example. Okay. Um, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Right? Each chromosome has you know, thousands of genes on it. Right? On average, somewhere around 1 to 2,000 genes. Okay. And so um, that's just sort of one physical molecule of DNA, right? start to finish, you know, millions of bases of DNA, um, but one linear intact molecule. Right? And Part of that sequence over here might encode some particular enzyme. Part of that sequence over here might encode, say, a transcription factor. Okay? And so those two genes are on the same physical piece of DNA. Right? And, and so that's, that's why they're on, that's, they're on the same chromosome. And each of those chromosomes you have two copies of because you get one from each parent. Right, so, so, so this one we know was generated by crossing a flower like this with a flower that looked like this, but looked like this because it was big R, big R, big S, big S. Okay, and that's why it has two different chromosomes. Okay, so here's where the math starts. Okay, so from the counts, so you do this cross out in your garden, and you count the number of plants that look like this, 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 and this. These are all distinguishable from another, one another, right? Based on the combination of flower color and plant type. Okay? So you do the cross and you count up the number of each one, and that will tell you how far apart on the chromosome these two genes are. Okay? And here's the way it works. So these are the four classes of progeny, the same four that were along the bottom on the last slide. Okay? This one has red flowers and is short. This one has yellow flowers and is short. This one has red flowers and is tall. This one has yellow flowers and is tall. Okay? And these are their corresponding genotypes. Right? They all have the same little r, little s chromosome, and then the big r, or big s, little r, big s, big r, little s, little r, little s are what they got from that hybrid parent. Okay? Um, 
and then you count them. Okay, so here's one example of what might happen when you count these progeny. Okay, so you find that there are 103 of this type, right? And you're not count. Remember, you're not counting genotypes directly. You're just counting the number of plants that look like this. Okay, you get 103. This is why Mendel could do it because he didn't know about DNA, he didn't know about genes, but he knew how to see what plants look like. Okay, so 103 of those, 88 yellow flower short, 92 red flower tall, 97 yellow flower tall, okay? So based on these numbers, we can make a conclusion about how far apart these two genes are on the chromosome. Okay, so left hand very far apart, right hand very close, both hands somewhere in between. Left hand far apart, right hand close, both hands in between. No hands is not an option. All right. Left hands have it, okay? They're very far apart, and that is because these are the two classes that should be rare if they're, if they're close together, right? If these two genes are close together, then the chance of generating this little r big S or big R little s chromosome is very small, okay? But in fact, what you see is that there are almost as many of these as there are of the two parental types, okay? And that leads to the inference that these two genes must be very far apart on the chromosome. They're still on the same chromosome. You get fewer of these than you do of these, okay? But not much fewer, okay? Almost the same. So here's another example of what could happen. Right, conclusion, far apart. Here's another example of what can happen. You get 184 of these, two of these, three of these, 191 of those. Okay, left hand very far apart, right hand very close together. Okay, so you all got it right this time. These two are very close together. And the reason we know that is because these are so rare. Okay, these are so rare because these two genes don't get broken and recombined in between them very often, and that means they must be very close together. Okay, the one example I'm not showing you is something like two, three, a hundred, a hundred, okay? And the reason is that will never happen. It will never ever happen because you will always get at least as many parental types as recombinant types. Okay, any questions about that? Because now we're gonna get to how you actually find genes that are associated with traits. Right, so these are obviously relative terms, okay? And the way genetic maps are built is that um, the distances on them are not nucleotides, they're not millimeters. Um, the distance are actually percentages of recombinant, okay? So we can go from numbers like this and say what a distance is. We, we would say in this case that it's basically this plus this divided by the total. And we just call that the distance. So that distance is higher than this plus this divided by the total of all of those. Okay? And we just, we just use that as our way of measuring distance. Okay? Now, in the modern age, you can convert that into nu nucleotides because we have complete genome sequences now. So you can say, well, if if the distance is 40% recombination, we now know that that's, you know, so many millions of bases on the certain chromosome. And if the distance is, you know, 1% recombination, we know that that's, you know, maybe 10,000 bases or something on a chromosome. Um, but originally it was just, you know, percentage recombination. And then you can draw a map just using that. Any other questions before we go on? Okay. Now this is the tricky part, right? The tricky part is, if you think about the question I originally posed is, we don't know what the genes are that control the traits, okay? We start out with a question, here's a trait difference that's inter interesting and we wanna find the genes, okay? So that's harder than just saying what the distance is between two genes, right? That we know control a difference in the trait. Now we're saying we're working backwards. We know that there's a difference in the trait and we wanna find the gene, okay? so. We can use this principle, though, to help us, though, okay? Um, and here's the way it works, okay? 
Now remember what you're doing here is you're taking a trait of interest and you're trying to find a gene that's associated with that trait of interest. So I'm going to simplify a little bit and say we're not worried about the color and the height of the plant anymore. We're just worried about the color of the flower. Okay? So I know that some plants in my species that I care about are red flowered and some are yellow flowered and I want to find a gene or mo one or more genes that are responsible for that difference. Okay? Because maybe if I can find that then I can make some other flower I really like red because I can take that gene and transfer it into that flower. Okay? So, okay, so how do we find the gene that contributes to this difference between red and yellow flowers? Okay? We do a cross the same way. We take these two plants and we cross them together and we'll get some hybrid that uh, has whatever flower color it has. Um, it might be more like one parent. It might be somewhere in between. Um, we'll see when we do the cross. Okay. Um, and we have to do one other thing. We have to take a bunch of genes we know and make sure that they're different between these two plants. Okay, and that's what I've drawn as A, B, C, D, E, N, F. These are what are usually called marker genes. Okay, and in order for this whole thing to work, we need a bunch of marker genes that we know are different between the two parental plants. Okay, now, a hundred years ago, those marker genes would be other physical traits in the plant. Okay, so for example, if you're trying to find where on the chromosomes a gene that contributes to this difference is, you might use other genes that you already knew about as relevant markers to place this gene into. Okay? Nowadays, we use DNA. Okay? So all of these markers will basically be nucleotide differences in the DNA sequences of these two parents. Okay? And as you know, any species like us, like flies, like plants of, of every type, um, any two individuals you pick are going to have a bunch of genetic differences between them. They're going to have a bunch of DNA differences between them. And many of those don't have anything to do with how the, plant, the plants or the animal or the human you know, behaves or looks or anything. They're just there. Okay? And so we can use them as markers. And so what you have to imagine is that in researching these plants, we found a bunch of genes, and we know their locations on the chromosome because we might have the entire DNA sequence of that chromosome. And, we, and if we've sequenced this variety of plant and this variety of plant, we know that at a certain place on the chromosome, we have an allele here that's different from an allele here. And all I mean by that, by calling it big A and little a, is that in this parent, you have, say, a T at a certain position on the chromosome. And in this parent, you have a C, or a G and an A, or any single nucleotide difference. Okay. And as long as we have some way of reading out those differences, um, then we can use that as a genetic marker. Because it'll be inherited the same way these genes that control traits are inherited. So if you think about it, let's, let's take this marker, OK? And let's say that in this parent, it's, there's a gene that has a T. Or let's make it easier. A gene that has an A in a particular position, OK? And this parent has a different allele, OK? And so it has a T in the same position. So when these two parents are crossed, then the hybrid is going to be heterozygous. So it's going to have an A and a T. Okay? And we can follow those because we can use whatever techniques we know about, like DNA sequencing or running a gel or doing a restriction digest to find which allele a particular plant inherited. And what we would find is that this plant inherited this allele and that allele. It would have the, the, the A version of it and the T version of it. Okay, and I'll show you an example of, of a gel like that in a second. Um, but this isn't the end of the experiment. This is the beginning of the experiment. Because as you saw before, we don't just take this. This hybrid actually contains no information because all hybrids from this cross are identical. They'll have whatever trait they have, and they'll have this genotype. Okay? In order to, to map genes, you need to cross this back to the recessive parent. Okay? And so the format of the cross is exactly the same. Now you take this hybrid, which has this genotype, and cross it back to the recessive parent. 
And then what do you get? Well, you're going to get a variety of flower colors. Okay? And the reason you're going to get a variety of flower colors is, is there's going to be one or more genes that control this difference in the trait. Now, if all you got in the progeny were red flowers or yellow flowers, then it would be very likely that there was only one gene controlling that trait. Because as you know from the example that we just did, if you have, say, a big R and a little r, and you cross them, then half the progeny get big R, half the progeny get little r. You'll have half red flowers, half yellow, yellow flowers. Okay? But if you get a mix like this, where you get different shades of red or yellow, okay, then that almost certainly means that there's more than one gene contributing to the trait. Okay? So similarly to complex human traits like heart disease or diabetes and so on. Um, there will be multiple genes contributing to the trait. Um, and the task then is to find one or more genes that have an influence on the trait. Okay? And so basically what you're looking for in these progeny is associations between the flower color and these genetic markers. Okay? It's exactly the kind of thing that you would do if you were trying to find genes associated with obesity. You're looking for associations between body mass index and particular genetic markers, okay, like that allele of the INSIG2 gene. Okay? And so that's, that's basically what you have. You have all of these progeny with whatever flower color they have, and you get their genotypes. So you know, for example, that this flower might be big A, big B, big C, little d, little e, little f. Okay? And from that information, what you do is for each marker, you ask whether there's associ an association with what color the flowers are. Okay? And this part is actually, I think, fairly straightforward to understand. Okay? So what you do is you take all of these flowers you get, right? And you say, okay, this one's really red, this one's really red, this one's really red, this one's really yellow. Okay? And all the red ones I'm going to put into one group, and all the yellow ones I'm going to put into to one group. Okay? And then I'm going to ask, do the red ones tend to have more big A's than little A's? Do they tend to have more big B's than little B's? Do they tend to have more big C's than little C's? Okay? And I'm going to ask the same thing for the yellow ones. Okay? And so you can get a table that starts to look like this. So among your red flowers and among your yellow flowers, you ask how many big A, big a alleles you get. And remember, if, if a gene has nothing to do with a particular trait, then the expectation is 50%. Okay? Because it doesn't matter if you got big A or little a, it's not anywhere near a gene that makes a difference for the flower color. And that's pretty much what you see in this example for a big A. So among the reddish flowered plants, 51% of them have a big A alleles. Among the yellowish flower ones, 47% have, have the big A alleles. So that doesn't look like there's much of an association between what the genotype is at this big A uh, or little a gene and what the flower color looks like. Okay? But we do that for all of the markers we have. Okay? And so in this case we have six markers. And what you can see is for big B versus little b, again, there's, there's no real association between what color the flowers are and what the probability is that you get a big B versus a little b allele. Okay? But then things start to change. So if you look at C, then now there's a difference. So among the reddish flowers, um, they're much more likely to have a big C allele than a little C allele, 60 to 40 percent. And reciprocally, the yellow flowers tend to have little C alleles instead of big C alleles, because they only have 39 percent big C. Okay? So what that means is that somewhere near this C marker is a gene that is affecting flower color. Okay? And as we go farther along the chromosome, you see that there's even a stronger association with D. So if you look at the reddish flowers, 94% of them have a big D allele instead of a little d allele. And if you look at the yellowish flowers, 5% of them have a big D allele instead of a little d allele. Okay? And E is similar to C, and then F you're pretty much back to 50-50 again. Okay? And so the way to look at this is that somewhere around D, there's a really strong correlation between 
whether you get big D or little d, and what color the flower is. So you take your, you take all of your flowers, right? Okay. And you say, here's a red one, here's a red one, here's a red one. You take all of the red ones, okay? Then you grind them up, you get their DNA, you figure out whether they have big A, little b, big B, little b, and so on, right? And for each one, you basically then have its genotype, okay? So for those red flowers, let's say you have, you know, 100 red flowers, and you say, okay, this one is big B, this one's little b, this one's big B, this one's little b. You ask how many B's, big B's do you get out of 100 and how many little B's do you get out of 100? And that's where you get these numbers. So th you're right. So, the, so I intentionally have not made these add up to one, right? So, so the question is, like, why is this 51% and 47%? Where's the other percent, right? So that's because you're intentionally choosing the extremes. Right, you're choosing the red ones and you're choosing the yellow ones, and you're not choosing all of them. You're not saying for each flower is it on the red side or on the yellow side. If if you counted each flower, then these would have to add up to one. Right, but you're not. You're saying just among this these red ones, what's the what's the probability, and among these yellow ones, what's the probability? You'll see in a second, I hope. Ask me again, it, right. Right, so ask me again in, in two slides. Okay. So, right, so basically, you can look at a table like this, and this is exactly the kind of thing that's done in these human studies. Is there an association with a particular allele and the trait of interest, right? And so when, the, when that science paper said, we did a genome-wide scan of DNA samples for blah, 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 what they mean is they had a lot of markers. They had many more than six markers. They probably had thousands of markers along the chromosomes. And for each marker, they say um, it has, two, say, two alleles. Is this allele overrepresented among the obese uh, members of the sample or underrepresented or neither? Okay? And they just scan along each marker. Is there an association with obesity or not? Is there an association with obesity or not? And the one with the highest probability was this INSIG2 RS blah, blah, blah allele, where they said, wow, there's a really strong correlation between having that allele and being obese. Right, but, but when those guys jump up and down and say there's a really strong correlation, what they mean is that it's a few percent higher than every other correlation. Okay, it's, it's still a very small effect, right? So this is a very exaggerated example where it's very obvious that there's an association between the color and so that's what the scan does, right? Um, and so the question th then becomes, well, how do we rationalize this result in terms of like the recombination I was just talking about? How do we know that then there, what this means is there must be a gene near D that contributes to the flower color trait, okay? Uh, because that is the conclusion that we make. So the way to see it is um, to sort of combine these two ways of looking at things that we've been doing, okay? So this was the original cross we did where we have the hybrid cross to the recessive parent and then you get this variety of progeny and these are the ones where we ask what their alleles are, okay, among the red ones and among the yellow ones, okay? And so um, what I'm drawing in now is we, we, we just discovered from, and I'm telling you that the inference we make from looking at that table of associations is that there must be a gene near D that contributes to this um, this trait, right? And I actually place it in between D and E because for E there's also a fairly high correlation, okay? And so I'm gonna say uh, sort of um, provisionally that, that somewhere between D and E, probably closer to D, is this gene that we're looking for, okay? And so let's see if that logic works out, okay? So I'm drawing in this new gene here that's in between D and E. And instead of giving it a name and a letter and stuff, I'm just color coding it. So, so the allele that I'm drawing on this chromosome is red because it's associated with the red flower. And the allele that I'm drawing on the other chromosome is yellow because it's associated with yellow flowers. Um, and I'm drawing it in between D and E closer to D. 
Okay, and then we'll see if the logic works out. Okay, so basically what happens in this cross is that this parent always gives identical gametes. Okay, it always gives a copy of this chromosome basically because it's the same as this chromosome. All of the little a, little b, little c, little d, little e, little f markers and the yellow allele of this hypothetical gene that's sitting in between D and E. Okay? This parent is where the action is going on. right? So this parent can give many, many different types of gametes because it'll have or not have recombination events, breakings and rejoinings in between any of these markers. Okay? And so if this new gene is somewhere I very close to D, the probability of D and it being separated by a recombination event is very low. Whereas the probability of it being separated by um, A is very high, because A is farther away. Okay? And that's what we'll see in the progeny. Right? So if we track big A and little a in the progeny when the gene is over here, then there is a 50% chance that big A will be with red or little a will be with red. And so when we look at those red flowered plants, we're just going to see 50-50, big A, little a. Okay? But when we look at D, okay, the probability of a recombination happening between D and this gene is very, very small. Okay? So if you look at the red plants, they're going to be carrying that allele, and then almost all of them are going to be carrying big D as well, because big D was not separated from red by a recombination event. And that's what I've drawn here. So you have a red flower with the red allele of that gene. You have a red flower, red allele, red flower, red allele, okay? A reddish flower, red allele, yellowish flower, yellow allele, yellowish flower, yellow allele, and so on, okay? So what that says basically is this logic sort of works forward and backward, okay? Another way of saying it is that you could have just by trial and error said, um, let me place this gene here and figure out what they expect expected result of the cross is. If you put the gene here, then you expect D to be separated from it. Um, and so the probability of getting big D among the red flowers would be much lower than 95%. It would have been you know, closer to 50%. Okay? So pretty much the only place on the chromosome that works to place this gene is very close to D and probably in between So the recombination could happen um, sort of in between D and this gene. It could, be, could happen in between the gene and E. Right? The way I've drawn it, there's a much higher probability, but still not a very high probability, of the recombination happening here than here. Okay? And so that's why in um, this example, right? you have a recombinant, right? You have little d with big E, okay? Little d is still sort of, in a sense, giving you the right information about this, this yellow allele, okay? But big E is no longer giving you the right information about that allele, because big E, um, sorry, I said that backwards. No, I said that correctly. Um, little d would normally go with the yellow allele and little e, but in this case, there was a recombination event here, and so you get little d, little e, Little d, yellow, and big E. Okay? And that's why for E, the percentage was not like 95%. Oops. It was like 79%. So 21% of the red flowers will still have um, a little e allele. And, and, and <coughs> you know, some per similar percentage on the other side will have sort of the wrong e allele associated with yellow flowers. And that's basically this plant here, where it has the little d allele that was originally linked to the yellow, but it doesn't have little e, it has big E. Right? You with me? OK. So the way to think about it is we should be able to go backwards from here and recreate this table, OK? Or at least our expectation for that table, OK? And so what you notice here 
is that if you look at the red plants, they have big D, right? And if look, you look at the yellower ones, they have little d, okay? That's sort of that really tight association between the marker, D, and the flower color, right? And that's what, let, that's what lets us say that the gene that's influencing the flower color is near D, okay? For E, here we have um, reddish flowers that are big E, red flower, big E, red flower, big E. Looks like the same kind of correlation. Um, we have yellowish flowers that are little e, yellow, yellowish flower that's little e. But you have this one ex exception, okay, where you have a yellowish flower that's big E. And the inference there is that's because you know there's a sufficient distance here where sometimes there's going to be a recombination that separates um, this from this, and so you'll get yellow with big E, right? And so the more of these you see the further apart you infer that E is from this actual gene, right? But because we basically don't see any of big D with yellow or little d with red, those are very close together. Yes, next slide. Good, good segue. Um, okay, so Right, so, so now basically we know that the gene is probably somewhere between D and E close to D, but you know, who cares, now, right? So now we can draw a map that shows it's in between D and E, but does that really get us anywhere? The, the, the task is to say, well, okay, what, what actual gene is it? You know, which DNA sequence does that correspond to? Not is it to the left of D or to the right of D, okay? Um, and so I just want to introduce a tiny bit of terminology because that's the terminology that's used to describe that question, basically. Okay, and it's what's called a quantitative trait locus or loci. So you heard uh, Benno Muller Hill in that video clip called "Genes Loci." Okay, for our purposes, gene locus, locus genes, interchangeable words. Okay, um, it's called a locus in the sense of place on a chromosome. Um, a quantitative trait locus is a gene that contributes to a particular phenotypic difference of interest. Okay, so here's the here's the definition: a quantitative trait locus, which is hard to say, so we say QTL. A QTL is a location on a chromosome, presumably containing a gene, that has alleles that correlate with a measure of a phenotype of interest. So we can say that the um, this place in between D and E is a QTL for flower color, right? Um, okay. Some phenotypes might be correlated very strongly with alleles of a single QTL, and those are what we usually call Mendelian traits. So something like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia, um, diseases that are caused by mutations in a single gene um, are Mendelian traits. And what you would observe if you were doing this kind of mapping experiment to try and find a QTL is there would be one QTL. There would be one major place in between two particular markers that correlated with the disease and nowhere else on the chromosome would correlate with the disease. Okay. Most traits, as I've said, are not like that. They're not Mendelian. Sometimes they're called non-Mendelian. Uh, most of the time they're called complex. Okay. So. There are many, many phenotypes, like propensity to diabetes, risk of heart disease, and so on, um, that are correlated with several or many QTLs. And no one of those QTLs shows an effect anywhere like a Mendelian gene. Okay? So an example is obesity. Right? There's no one place on the chromosome where you can say that there's a huge difference between people with one allele versus people with another allele. Okay? At most, the largest effect QTL in those cases is actually still very small, right? Um, and so uh, that's the situation we're usually in. And so our task is basically to find these QTLs and find the genes that are underlying them because that, that might help us understand those traits, right? Um, the reason we map genes for um, you know, propensity to heart disease is because we think it might actually help us treat those diseases. The reason we 
try and map genes that are associated with flower color in a plant is because somehow knowing that those genes is going to be useful to us as plant breeders, for example.